Thank you all for being here. My name is Thomas Cameron. Uh, I am the Global Solutions Architect Leader at Red Hat. Um, big old computer nerd. My contact info is up there. I am Thomas D. Cameron on Twitter. And uh, if you need to reach me, I'm thomas at redhat.com. I have been there for that long. Um, so we're going to be moving really, really fast. So I want to I wanted say two things real quickly. Um, this is a very simple overview of, the, of, of container security, right? So you've got, we've seen some very, very highly technical um, presentations. This is going to be fairly generic and fairly uh, rapidly moving. Um, and this has been paired from a one hour session down to a 45 minute down to a 25 minute session. So I'm going to be speaking very, very quickly, which is hard for a Texas boy. So bear with me. All right. So agenda is we'll go over um, what containers are, what Red Hat has done with containers, a little bit about how they work, um, what they're not. Uh, and then we'll talk about the elements of container security, including kernel namespaces, control groups, the Docker daemon, Linux kernel capabilities, SE Linux, some tips and tricks, and come to some conclusions. So by way of introduction, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm Thomas Cameron. I've been with Red Hat uh, for about 10 years. I've been in IT since 1993. Prior to that, I have a very strong interest in security and, and things like that because I was actually a police officer. I changed careers uh, after about eight years of law enforcement work. I went, you know what? I don't want to work nights anymore, and I want to actually make enough to afford to buy a you know, car and a house and those things. So I moved into IT. Um, but I've, I've been in IT for a long time. I've done the Microsoft route. I've done the Novell route. That's dating me. Um, uh, and, and so I've spent a lot of time working on security, so I don't claim to know everything. Holy crap, the longer I'm in IT, the more I realize, the less I know, right? Uh, but I am kind of a big old nerd. So um, what we have done, what my company Red Hat has done with containers, a lot of folks kind of don't realize this. We've been working with container technologies for a very long time. We actually first started uh, working on containers back around the 2010 time frame. We acquired a company called Makara in 2010 that was a platform as a service uh, vendor. We started working on containerization as far back as 2010. Um, we rebranded it as OpenShift. We did some pretty cool things around what we called cartridges, which now we kind of uh, everyone calls containers, using SE Linux, uh, Linux kernel control groups, and kernel namespaces. And frankly, uh, in 2013, when Docker really became sort of popular and started really getting a lot of mind share, we realized that it really made sense for us to, instead of trying to do our own way of doing containerization, we adopted a lot of the technologies that Docker is doing. We work with you know, Google on Kubernetes. We have uh, contributions to Mesos and things like that. And we are a top contributor to the Docker Upstream project. And you guys all know it, right? The, the adoption of Docker has been pretty phenomenal. Um, been through multiple successful venture capital rounds as a company. Uh, all these vendors, Absera, EMC, us, Huawei, IBM, all are on board with uh, doing some standardization around container formats. Even Microsoft has, support, has said that they're going to support Docker containers in Windows. <laughs> so containerization really does appear to be and I hate to make predictions, right, because we all know how predictions in IT work out, but really does seem to be a pretty phenomenal way towards the future. So now normally when I give this is a you know, smaller, smaller environment, so a little bit of background. What are containers? Um, well, containerization, specifically Docker, is a technology that allows uh, applications like web applications or, or database applications, uh, app services, and so on to be abstracted from and in some isolation from the underlying operating system. The Docker service can launch containers regardless of the underlying Linux distro, which is really, really cool, right? I, I work with RPM-based distros. Some folks work with you know, apps-based distros. It's kind of cool that they can all play nicely with each other a lot more easily with containerization. Um, they also, containerization can also lend itself to incredible application density. For our OpenShift online uh, service, that we offer up um, for uh, our customers, we are seeing literally um, thousands, like 3,000 applications on a single medium instance in EC2. Think about that, man. That kind of application density, for someone who's an old sysadmin like me, getting that kind of application density is like black magic. <laughs> what is this magic? I mean, it's crazy. It's, it's amazing. Um, but the same container can run on different versions of Linux. I can run Ubuntu containers on Fedora. I can run CentOS containers on RHEL. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Nah, maybe not. But it's pretty incredible what P 
people are doing with containers, considering the disparate sort of directions that people are coming from, from a technology background. Uh, so really, the big goal is we make it easier for application developers to build and deploy apps. That raises the question, what are containers not? Well, for one thing, containers are not a panacea. They are not the cure for all that ails you. Not every workload makes sense in a container. They're not the thing to do everything in. Containerize all the things. A lot of apps make sense there. Some don't yet. Uh, and they're not virtualization. I've had a lot of conversations with folks who are trying to wrap their heads around it. They're like, so is this like the next generation of virtualization? Eh, not really, no, because you can run, and I do it all the time. I can run containers on my bare metal machine. Uh, it's not virtualization like most people think of, a la Red Hat Enterprise virtualization or VMware or Parallels or VirtualBox or whatever. So how do we deal with security with uh, uh, containers? So. Containerization today, and I'm going to be speaking generally uh, about what you see around Docker containers, but um, containers use several mechanisms and several layers for security. Uh, Linux kernel namespaces, we also use Linux control groups, and you'll hear me refer to that as C groups. The Docker daemon provides some security, uh, and Linux actually uses um, uh, capabilities or libcap uh, capabilities to limit what containers can do. And then finally, we wrap it up in security mechanisms like AppArmor, or as I know, because I'm a Red Hat guy, SE Linux, and I'll talk about those. So kernel namespaces. How many, I mean, how many folks, first off, how many folks knew that, that one of the things that we use for containerization is kernel namespaces? How many folks, if your mother asked you what kernel namespaces were, would be able to describe it? Not nearly as many hands went up, right? I got asked one time, because I was talking to a group of folks, and I was like, yeah, you know, it's really cool because we use kernel namespaces to segregate workloads, and somebody was like, well, how does, what, what is that? And I'm like, it's uh, spaces that names in the kernel, and, the, and like, you think about that for a second, you're like, how do I describe what a kernel namespace does? So I decided that I was going to do a presentation on it and force myself to be able to do so. Namespaces, just a way to make a global resource appear to be unique and isolated. So the namespaces that the Linux kernel can manage include mount namespaces, PID namespaces, UTS namespaces, IPC namespaces, network namespaces, and user namespaces. So let's look at what some of those are. Mount namespaces are pretty awesome. Basically, it allows the container to think that the file system that it's accessing is exclusively the, the purview of that container. Um, so when you start a container with the dash V, the host path and then the container path, argument, and then you can also say you want it to, do, to be read-only or uh, read-write, um, you can mount a directory from the host inside of the container, and as far as the container is concerned, it's the only one who has access to that environment. So it's a really cool way of doing things like saying, okay, I have content that I may need one container or I may need 50 containers to be able to access, but I don't want them to be able to modify it. So you can do some cool things there. Uh, for instance, the var www HTML directory, you can mount that inside of containers and make that globally available. And I did an example of this to show what that means. So if you look at the top line, I'm logged in as root on my, my laptop, and I cat var www HTML index.html, and I say, okay, there's my content. Then I use docker run dash it dash v, give it the local path, var www html, where I want to mount it inside of the container, which I also do var www html. Um, and then uh, I could set that read only if I wanted to. And I'm going to do a Fedora instance and run the bash command. And so now you see that my uh, prompt has changed so that I'm, instead of being uh, in, in the context of my shell on the, uh, the host, now I'm inside of my container, but I still see that same content. So all that kernel namespaces, or I'm sorry, uh, file system namespaces do is it allows for the container to think that it has exclusive purview over something when it actually doesn't. Um, and, and of course, that lends itself to security because again, you can lock that content down so that the, the contents of the um, container may not be, they could be immutable. So we also have um, PID namespaces. Uh, PID namespaces, again, let the, the container think that it's a completely new instance of the operating system. So when I fire up a new instance or a new container, it's going to get a new process ID. Um, PID namespaces mean that the container internally, inside of the container, 
thinks that it's a brand new instanti instantiation. So I'm going to launch a Fedora container using uh, Bash, running Bash, and I run PS dash, or PSAX. The container sees itself as being, oh, there's process ID 1, right? So I fired it up. I did docker run dash IT Fedora and then run the Bash command. So I brought up a Fedora container. I'm running PSAX, and it's like, oh, I only have two processes running. I am unique. I am all by myself. But in reality, if I go back to another console and I do a, uh, a PSAX, then you can see that that bash process is actually 18.5.18. That's just an example of how the same actual process gets two process IDs, sort of. One of them is emulated inside of the Docker container. It thinks it's all by itself and there's nothing else going on. So user namespaces, when you start up a, a container, assuming you've added your user to the Docker group, you can start it as your user account, right? So in the following example, I'm going to start an, a, a container. I'm logged in as T Cameron. You can see that I've got the, the dollar sign prompt up there. I'm logged in as T Cameron. I run the ID command. You can see that I'm ID 1000, but I run Docker run and I fire up a bash prompt. Now when I do ID, even though it's the same process and I've, been, I've spawned that process by a non-privileged user, user namespaces says to the inside of the container like, yeah, 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 your root, your root, sure, your root. So your, your root inside of that container, but do you see from a security perspective, it's kind of nice to be able to isolate and jail them so that if they do something stupid or malicious, usually stupid, malicious sometimes, but you do something stupid inside of the container, you can trash that container and that's fine. Trash that container all you want, kids. My machine, if I'm the hosting company or whatever, my machine is still fine. There's your foot. Here's a gun. Have fun. Network namespaces abstract out networking. Uh, it allows containers to have their own host names, their own IP addresses. Uh, I'm sorry, just IP addresses. I'll talk about uh, other namespaces in a little while. Um, but it, ha it allows that to have its own IP address independent of that of the host. And the first time that I did this, I was like, what on earth? How, how do I get to it? Where do I? Well, that's part of when the Docker service runs and you run, you know, you bring up new containers, you can set up rules for um, uh, routing to and from those hosts. So what I did on this one was a little bit different. I had to use Docker inspect. So I used Docker inspect to give it the format and search for network settings IP address from the instance that's running. And you see that it comes back and it says it's got a 172.17.0.7 address. If I run IP address show on my network interface, I'm not on the 172.17 network, right? This is that layer of abstraction that Namespaces gives us so that the, the Docker container believes I've got my own networking stack I'm independent of. In reality, we can't get to or from that unless whatever the wrapper, in this case the Docker service, um, is going to set up uh, network rules. So it, again, it's just a way to abstract out networking so that you can have networking services that come up but they're not necessarily exposed on the outside. Interprocess communications namespaces or IPC namespaces, same thing. It abstracts it out so that um, the, the Docker container or the container that's come up can have any IPCs that are running inside of it, but they're not even aware that there are other IPCs on the host. And in this example, I've spun up a, a bash prompt on a Fedora container, and I run IPCS, and there's nothing. There are no interprocess communications, obviously, because it's a freshly spun up uh, uh, container, where on the host, if I do IPCS, you can see that there's thousands of interprocess, well, maybe not thousands, lots of interprocess communications. And so, um, again, this is just an example of how we abstract out so that the container thinks that it's got a green field, it's got its own uh, spaces, but then it doesn't or it's actually segregated from the host. UTS or Unix time sharing system namespaces let the container think it's its own separate operating system with its own host name, own, own domain, blah, domain name, and so on. Um, you guys are welcome to take pictures. I see several people taking pictures. You are absolutely welcome to take pictures, but I'm also sending these slides to the container camp folks so that they can publish it here. You can download them and, and have them. Take pictures all you want. I'm, you know, I'll smile, give you my good side, but you can get those. Not that I really have a good side, but so in this case, I run host name from my laptop, and it gives me a legitimate host name, t540p.tc.redhat.com. If I run host name from within my container, that's just a randomly generated host name that doesn't have anything to do with the host name on my, on my laptop or in my VM or whatever. Um, so this is just an example of that. Again, the namespace abstraction that segregates that from uh, uh, the host OS. 
Now, changing gears, moving away from kernel namespaces over into Linux control groups. Linux control groups are an awesome way of basically aggregating and segregating or part partitioning sets of tasks, including all uh, child processes. So I can fire something up inside of a Linux control group, and I can put limits on it around disk I.O., around network I.O., around CPU usage, around memory usage, and so on. Um, and I can be really granular on how much capacity I'm going to give to something. This is a phenomenal way of segregating out my containers. If you start a container inside of a Linux, uh, inside of a control group, somebody can do a fork bomb inside of it, somebody can do something stupid or malicious, and again, the, if you give them no more than 5% of CPU, for instance, and no more than 5% of network I.O. or no, you know, disk I.O., whatever, they can be as malicious as you want, and, you, and inside of their VM, or not VM, I can't say that, bad, um, inside of their container, um, they can totally overwhelm that container to where the container becomes unresponsive and it looks like they've totally trashed your system. In reality, they're only using 5% because of the Linux control groups. So even if a container is compromised or just spins out of control, there are limits in place which make sure that uh, it doesn't damage anything else. Now, when I run the command system control status on the Docker service, I get the control group and slice information. So you can see that in general, just on a standalone machine, every instance of Docker, for instance, is going to have its own Linux control group. So if you put parameters around it and say you're not going to get any more than X amount, then, um, then you can stop it from taking down the rest of the system. Now, there are like 8,500 entries in the pseudo file system for control groups. I'm not going to go into all, I mean, I can't go into all of them. We've only got a few more minutes left. Uh, but control groups are an awesome way of segregating your system and making sure that a runaway or a compromised uh, uh, service or process doesn't take down the rest of the system. And the Docker daemon itself actually um, does do a lot of security there as well uh, within it. So um, you want to make sure there's some considerations when you're running Docker. You want to make sure that only trusted users have access to it. You've got to put somebody into the Docker group, for instance. Um, you, if you're using the REST API to manage your hosts, make sure that you're wrapping that in SSL. Make sure you don't have any um, vulnerabilities exposed. Keep up with your security best practices, um, so on and so forth. Linux kernel capabilities, uh, changing gears again, or libcap. So this is a, a pretty esoteric stack of information, or a bit of information. Um, root, historically, has total power over the system, right? If I'm root, I can do anything. I can bring up or take down networking, I can do file system stuff, I can do storage stuff, and so on. But libcap allows you to actually put filters so that capabilities that are presented to a user, a root user, or whatever, can be filtered so that within the container, they don't have access to things like damaging your file system or, or so on. A regular user, for instance, can be granted the NetBind service capability, and then they can uh, bind privileged services, or they can bind to a uh, privileged port, I should say, even though they don't have root equivalents. The reverse is true as well. You can filter things out and say, nope, you're not allowed to, within, for instance, a, a container, you're not allowed to run cron, for instance, or SSH services, or uh, do file system mounts and unmounts and things like that. Uh, by default, Docker disallows a lot of root capabilities, including the ability to modify logs, change networking, modify kernel memory, and the catch-all capsys admin uh, capability. This is kind of an eye chart, I apologize, but if you go and you look on GitHub at the Linux capabilities um, uh, filters within Docker, you can see all of the capabilities which are allowed and also disallowed. So again, even though you're root, quote unquote, within your, your container, the libcap filtering that we do or that Docker does actually prevents people from being hostile. And then my favorite topic, and I'm serious, I love SE Linux, I know I'm kind of weird that way, um, security enhanced Linux. So SE Linux is a mandatory access control system um, that allows you to put requirements around processes, files, memories, network interfaces, and so on. They all have labels. And those labels uh, are then managed by a policy which is administratively fixed. So that policy is going to determine how a process can interact with another process or with a file on the file system or a network port, for instance, or something like that. Um, and SE Linux is really concerned with labeling and type enforcement. So if I have a, a service called the Foo service, just a mythical service, um, 
the, the executable file on disk might have the foo exec label. Um, the startup scripts may have foo config labels. The log files may have foo log as a label. Uh, and then the, the, the rules or the type enforcement policy will say, well, the executable that's labeled foo exec has access to the files that are labeled foo config, because that makes sense, right? You want the foo, foo executable to be able to access the config files. But if the foo exec gets compromised and tries to access something with a label, I don't know, shadow, raise your hand if you think that's a good idea for a compromised service to be able to access the shadow file. We'll all laugh at you. Right? So that's how SE Linux labeling and type enforcement work. It's just what are the labels that are associated with the executables, the processes, the ports, and so on, and what are the rules that say you can access them. Now, I'm going to skip through this kind of quickly because we're down to about three minutes, but I do want to show you a, an example. Boom, 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 boom. So on a standalone system, um, what I do is, for, for an example, I should say, I'm going to pop over to, let me move to there. So what I'm going to do is, you can see that I'm logged in as root up at the top. My, I do ID and it's zero. But you can see down at the end, I wish I had a laser pointer. Do I? Is this a laser pointer? Ha ha, there we go. All right, so you can see that that is my SE Linux context. Now, what I'm going to do is, I'm logged in as root. I have root privileges. I'm going to change my context so that I have a limited context, kind of the same context as a Docker image would be on the Atomic server, for instance. Once I make that change, once I change my SE Linux context, I am still root. I should theoretically still have omnipotence on this system, right? But if I try to look, for instance, at the Etsy shadow file, permissions denied. If I try to create a file in the root of the file system, I still have ID zero, but it's going to deny me. If I try to look in slash home slash tcameron, I don't have access because my SE Linux context is wrong. And if I try as root to go, well, it's OK, I'll just turn off SE Linux, I, I'll get, that'll be denied as well because I don't have access to that, those changes. So I've got about two minutes left according to this, right? All right, cool. Whew. So what to do and what not to do. Containers are, at the end of the day, just processes running on the host. Use common sense when running those processes. Do have a process in place to update your containers and follow it. Run, uh, do run services in the containers with the lowest privilege possible. Drop root privileges wherever you can. Mount file systems read only if you can. Um, treat root inside the container just like you would on the host. Make sure you trust people that you're giving root access to, even if it's just to inside of a container. Watch your log files. Don't, don't just download any old container. Bill and Ted's excellent Docker repository is a great way to get in a lot of trouble. Be smart about what you're downloading and installing. Don't run SSH inside of your container. Please, for the love of God, don't run SSH inside of your container. I run into people who do that stuff all the time. Don't do it. Um, don't run with root privileges. Don't disable SE Linux. Um, there's, a, there's a video online called SE Linux for Mere Mortals from Red Hat Summit. I gave the session. Uh, it's one hour. If you watch that video and still want to disable SE Linux, send me an email at thomas at redhat.com and we'll go through it. I'll get you through it, I promise. Um, don't roll your own containers once and then never maintain them, and don't run protection, uh, production containers on unsupported platforms. I'm just going to throw some pieces together and put my business critical tasks on there. No. Whew. In conclusion, with 54 seconds remaining, <sighs> containers are awesome. I love containerization. I do believe that this is one of the big waves of the future. Um, they make application de deployment super easy. They leverage some incredible capabilities inside of Linux. By design, they're relatively secure, but there are some gotchas. As with every other piece of software out there, uh, it requires some feeding and maintenance. Pay attention to what you're doing. Well-maintained uh, containers can make your business more agile, less complex, and safe. Poorly maintained, you'll make the front page. <laughs>